short talk with a nice little simple, although perhaps sort of kind of mature and like message. Um, I also noticed actually when I looked at the title, it does sound a bit like a methods talk. So I apologise now if anyone's expecting a new method here or anything. Um, but that's not what this is. So basically, we want to try and put the aim of this to try and predict the conservation status of a group of animals, um, in this case amphibians, from chemical dependency, so from traits that we possess. But what? Well, the problem is that amphibians, especially, are an extremely threatened group of animals. In fact, they're the most threatened vertebrate class um, that we know. Um, and conservation resources if we want to preserve these animals are very limited. And therefore we actually need um, some kind of way of making decisions about whether to conserve this one, this one, if we can't do both, tough decision, how do you make it? And the way that's often done is trying to preserve the ones, trying to put most resources into the species which are most in need of it in some way, the most threatened species. And a quick and easy way to do this is to look at the IUCN Red List, and this is effectively, as I'm sure um, most people in this room will know, if not everyone, um, a kind of standardised category of everything from least concern, so not threatened, near threatened, <coughs> vulnerable and dangered, critical and dangered, extinct, etc. So it's effectively like a scale of how threatened these things are, and we might expect that actually we want to start protecting things that are in danger, critically in danger, rather than those that are least concerned, even if they're kind of declining or like that. And that's great. Except that 16.5% of all the species in IUCN uh, red by a state base are actually data deficient, which means we don't know enough about their populations to judge whereabouts in this that would fall. And to make matters worse, there's been a few studies that seem to suggest, trying to predict it in other ways, um, that the species that are data deficient are more likely to be in the higher threat categories. And that kind of makes sense. To be properly assessed, you really need to have good information in the population. That's fine if it's a nice common animal all over the place, you can do surveys, no problem. However, if you have a very rare, very secretive, generally very um, prone to extinction species, that's actually quite difficult to get that data in the first place. So what we really want to try and do is get around this and say, even if we have no idea how to, population, how to sample populations of this and it's just not feasible to do, can we at least make an educated guess as to whether that's worth protecting over this one? And trait-based prediction may be um, a good strategy here. Um, what we do know about a lot of animals is bits and bobs of ecology, natural history, morphology, all sorts of different things. And if any of these traits are linked to conservation status, then we can perhaps use that. And there's two ways that you can think of extinction risk. One is, such as in this paper, looking at macroevolutionary or background extinction rates um, or diversification rates. And that's fine. Um, I did this, I'll speak about that in a little second, I did this previously. The other one, however, is such as this paper here, I'm looking at current extinction risk. So it's all well and good saying, well, these things have been going extinct in the past, but actually things aren't the same as they were in the past. So these, ex the questions of extinction risk tend to go into a completely different scale, from macroevolutionary and population but the question is, are those scales relatable in any way, shape, or form? Can we learn anything from the many, many, many studies of trait-based diversification analysis that have been going on recently? And the biggest problem to this is that things are different now. Most of the threats that um, species face nowadays are actually related to humans. Um, humans aren't very good at surviving with all things, it seems. Um, so things like habitat destruction, um, logging, all sorts of threats like that, introduced species, actually a problem much more important now. So the causes of any extinction in a contemporary time scale are likely to be very different from the past. And that may kind of throw it off, and you might just not be able to predict anything from these analyses. So I'm not going to assume that any of you were here last year or came to my talk last year, but you should have because they're the dragons. <laughs> um, I've just got to pull out the main results from that just because this provides a justification for this analysis. Um, so basically, to cut a long story short, there were, there were about 850 or more groups of amphibian, species of amphibian um, from across the amphibian tree of life, for which I was able to determine whether or not they had a chemical defence. Almost always a toxic defence, or a poison. Some of them were a bit chlorine and things like that. 
And that's fine. So if there was no evidence for it, we'd left it. So this is quite conservative. They definitely do not have one, they definitely do. And fit, um, in this case, basic models for that data, and found, as you may expect, so it's a lot more intuitive, that the speciation rate is much higher in toxic frogs. Um, to be a bit flippant about that. Which is great. However, the extinction rate is actually much higher as well. So if you compare this, you find that um, speciation rates is increased by about a factor of two. It's actually increased by a factor of about two and a half um, for extinction rates. And therefore, the net diversification rate is actually lower in chemical defending species because of this heightened extinction. Just to add to this, um, um, just to point out how severe this may be, is the transition rates estimated in this model suggested that it's actually very, well, relatively easy to evolve a chemical defense, to evolve these toxins. What seems to be very difficult is losing them. So if you're an individual, great. Nothing to do with you, there's a high individual benefit. However, because it increases your background extinction risk, the whole lineage is potentially doomed, or at least more doomed than if you didn't involve this defense. So they end up locking themselves into this evolutionary trap. So to try and have a look to see if all of this um, prediction, which we really wouldn't, I mean, in prior, I would not have expected um, anti predator defense to increase extinction. So that's unexpected. Can we actually use that? Does that hold using a completely different type of data? So using the IUCN red list data for all the 850 odd species that we had, um, I basically fit a few different models of um, threat status towards the, the presence of Arctic Swift pets. And this is what we found um, if you separate them into non toxic and toxic frogs and probability being threatened. So this is whether they were vulnerable or higher or not vulnerable. And that's much higher. In fact, that's a 60% increase in the extinction rate um, in toxic frogs in the contemporary time scale, um, which ties in very nicely, and it quite highly significant as well, um, which ties in very nicely with the background extinction rates. So it does seem as if you can predict some of that. Just to try and look at that a little bit more depth, um, Rather than this kind of binary classification, I tried using it as a Poisson tree, so effectively an ordered tree from least concern through to extinct. And not quite as strong, bearing in mind that I use red list data are often a little bit fuzzy, so perhaps this is more detailed than the data can handle, but you do still see the same general decrease, except for non threatened species for some reason. Um, so effectively, the most um, threatened amphibians tend to have a higher proportion of toxic species. Now I'm going to talk about something just a little bit more controversial than that as well. Those analyses are relatively uncontroversial using, for example, phylogenetic logistic regression and um, phylogenetic Poisson regression. Now I'm going to talk about evolutionary pathway modeling. And the reason this is quite contentious is that red list states doesn't really evolve. And this model assumes that they do. The other models don't. But nevertheless, I do think we can glean something interesting from this. So what I was interested in particularly was whether either of these species of frogs, so this toxic dart frog and this non-toxic green tree frog, um, can go extinct just as easily, or whether we can fit a constrained model whereby actually toxin, the evolution of the toxins leads to um, the increase in the threat status. So can we tease apart some directionality in this? And it turns out actually there's quite a lot of support for this constrained model. So there does seem to be some evidence that it's the gain of this toxic defense that pushes, the, uh, pushes these amphibians towards a higher risk of becoming extinct. And that's great. But as I said, people are going to, I can see people twitching already. It does not evolve. I'm perfectly happy to say that. However, it is a bit like running a um, t test when the data are quite normally distributed. It doesn't quite meet the assumptions, but it's probably good enough to be meaningful in some way. And just to um, put a few justifications to kind of put, across any quest, put off any questions, hopefully. Um, is that, firstly, if you look at the IUCN red list status and you look at just a standard correlation test, it does give the same results as the logistic regressions, etc. that don't assume it evolves. So it doesn't seem to be completely misleading. You do still find a significant correlation. Also, red list status does show significant phylogenetic signal. So it at least acts in some ways, it behaves like an evolving trait. And actually, you might expect that anyway, because Red list status isn't really a thing, it's not a trait in its own right anyway. It's a proxy of a whole host of underlying biological traits that contribute towards an extinction risk. 
And many of those traits are likely to evolve. So actually, indirectly, I don't think it's too misleading to assume the regular states can be thought to evolve. But how does this work? Well, there's three possible explanations, but I don't think one of them is particularly plausible to explain these effects across both time scales. Because if you think about it, we have a situation whereby the threats that they're facing now compared to in, the, in deep time are very, very different. Therefore, any mechanism that holds across those two has to be very, very general. So imagine two populations of frogs, one toxic, one not. And imagine something like a disease sweeps through them, or some kind of something else. Something kills a lot of them that doesn't really care whether or not they're, fit, they're toxic or not. So it reduces the population. And that's great. So what this population is sitting at now is a very low number that is subject to stochastic population fluctuations and then therefore may just go extinct. What it has to try and do is get back to a nice healthy population size. And the thing is that a lot of anti-predator defences, um, certainly the more effective defences, tend to be linked to a slower life history, a reduction in life history, <coughs> simply because the mortality, the extrinsic mortality is low. So you see this entire shift to a slower life history. And if you imagine that these things have a much faster life history and actually have a much better rebound ability of the populations to get back up to this. Toxic amphibians will probably, although I still have to look at this actually, but I suspect that they've got slower life history and therefore are just hanging about in that lower population size long enough that the stochasticity of population fluctuations is enough to wipe them out at a higher rate than the non-toxic ones. So in the end, I think I've um, shown that chemical defence can be used as one of the set of traits to predict extinction risk in data deficient species. It does certainly seem to be associated with it. I'm not saying it's the most powerful trait. I don't think there's a good way of um, checking that. Um, but nevertheless, it does seem to be one of the two that it can be used. Trait-based diversification analysis, so these background extinction analyses can actually be used, at least in some cases, at least in this case, um, to do this. To, find traits that are useful for predictive modelling of IUCN readiness status and therefore extinction risk. And the same traits presumably are able to modify extinction risk across these vast timescales and across vastly different types of threat. So with that, hopefully I've left enough time for a couple